Shalom Aleichem. Peace to you all. Okay, I'm done. <clears throat> wow, Bob's right. It's really bright out there. Oh, praise. Did I do that? <clears throat> praise the Lord. Um, that dance and worship was so beautiful. It was. You're going to make the Israeli people jealous if you keep dancing like that. <clears throat> um, I just have to adjust to the lights, okay? Um, praise the Lord. It's a wonderful. Am I talking too loud? Is it okay? Thrilled to be with you in the Philippines. This is my first visit to the Philippines. Is it, is it too loud? I hear such an echo. It's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I couldn't talk because of the echo. Um, I'm going to speak to you tonight about a prophetic calendar. Um, let me just give a little bit of background so you understand why the Lord wants to connect the hearts of your princely nation to the calendar that most people think is just a Jewish calendar or Jewish holidays. Many people don't understand why that would be part of their intimate princely walk with the Lord right into the millennial kingdom. And so I'm going to be a bridge between Israel and the Philippine nation. Is that okay? By God's grace. Have any of you ever seen that children's movie called Cinderella? Okay. Do you remember there's a phrase, the king is giving a ball? Or the prince is giving a ball? You know, like a large formal dinner dance so the prince can meet his bride? Okay. Let's go all the way back to creation. Okay. Who made the times and the seasons? Who created the idea of a seven-day week? How did time come into existence? Okay, if you look at Genesis, if you look at Genesis 1.14, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky and let them serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Now, he created the sun, the moon, and the stars on the fourth day of creation, right? So there was light before that, but there were no markers of times and days and months and weeks. So the creator created those markers, right? Back then, were there any Jews or Gentiles? Actually, were there any people at all? No, we're at the fourth day of creation. We didn't come along for two more days, right? So he said, let there be seven days in a week. And he made man on the sixth day, and he rested on the seventh day. Amen? So he had a calendar. And he made a covenant that the sun would govern the day and the night. And later, as we fast forward into history, he created a yearly calendar. And he created a millennial calendar. He said, every year there will be this many lunar months. And every year, he created seven festivals or parties for his people to have an intimate banquet with him. And we call them the Feasts of the Lord. Okay? So, he gave them to Israel at Mount Sinai. But the seven days of creation existed probably at least 2,000 years before Mount Sinai, at least. And so, if the king is giving a party, if the creator says, I want to invite my people to a wedding banquet for my son, 
Doesn't he have a right to set the time and the place and the date of that party? Like in Cinderella, if the prince was giving a ball on Saturday, September 5th, would you show up on Tuesday, April 4th? No. Would you say to the king, um, gosh, I'm too busy that day. Could you, could you make it more convenient for my schedule? Would you ever ask the king to change the date of his party? Okay, what I'm trying to say is our God is an intimate God of relationship. And he has opened his arms to all the nations. And what did Bob speak about today? He said, we are one new man in Messiah Jesus. In Ephesians 2 and 3, Paul says this to all the Gentile churches. He says, you were once far apart and separated from the commonwealth of Israel. But he says, now you have been brought near to citizenship in Israel. Have you read that? There's no more separation. So if the king is giving a party seven times a year, do you want to be on the outside? Or do you want to share in the rich, nourishing treasures of the feasts of the Lord? They're not rules to ruin your life. They're not legalistic things you have to do to make God love you more. That's not what the feasts are about. This is just an introduction. I haven't started yet. <laughs> I'm trying to just convey the feeling that they are an intimate invitation. In fact, they're a rehearsal for the wedding supper of the Lamb. Because Matthew, Matthew 22 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet that the king gave for his son. Every time we celebrate these special feasts that we will be entering into together this week, we are doing a holy rehearsal. And so I want to start with a tiny bit of Hebrew, just like our brother Bob gave us a little Hebrew lesson. There are two Hebrew words for the feasts in the Bible. The first Hebrew word is moed. A moed is a time or a season or an appointment. How many of you ever heard them called the Jewish holidays? Did you ever hear that? Did you know that's not in the Bible? The Bible never calls them the Jewish holidays. God says they are my moedim. They're my appointed times with my people. They're his days. They're his appointed times. And the second word in Hebrew is mikra. A mikra is a holy assembly or a holy rehearsal. Now, some of the feasts are rehearsing past acts that God did in the past, and some are rehearsing the future coming of the kingdom of God. Okay? So tonight, my purpose for this message is to give us a big sweeping prophetic picture of what the feasts represent in your walk with the Lord Jesus and how every feast is going to bring you into deeper intimacy with his heart because he is the son of David forever. He is of the tribe of Judah forever. Because the first verse in the New Testament says he's the son of King David. And the last words of Jesus in the New Testament in Revelation says, Behold, I am the root and the offspring of David. So his identity is sealed forever as a Jewish king of the royal tribe of Judah, a descendant of King David. Amen? And every feast is going to delight your heart. And the book, I, the book I wrote on the feasts that Bishop Dan was referring to shows you how to do them in a way that is not a burden to your soul. It's not like, oh, here's one more thing I have to do. It's nothing like that. It's, I get to do it. It's a privilege to do it. I don't have to do anything. 
But it's a privilege to make God's heart happy, like, like better than wine, right? Doesn't the Bible say your love is better than wine? Your love for him tastes better to him than wine. And his love is better than wine and the pleasures of this world to us. Amen? Have you ever been so in love with the Lord that he just satisfied you in a way that nothing in this world could ever do? That's consecration. That's consecration. That's the goal of everything that we do till he comes back. So let's move on. Um, let's see. Do you remember Bob was talking about prophetic patterns in the Bible? Remember today he said Moses built the tabernacle on earth according to the pattern that he saw in heaven. Remember? And when Brother Robert Mist asked me to write that CD, Sounds of Heaven, he said to me, he was a total stranger to me at the time. We had never heard of each other. I just have to tell this really quickly. He was taken to heaven, and he saw and heard the worship of the cherubim, the cherubim around the throne. He heard the worship of the elders casting down their crowns. He saw it. He smelled it. He tasted it. And he wanted to hear real earthy music that was a pattern of that. But he couldn't find it. And we never heard of each other, but the Lord caused him to email me. It's a whole long miracle story that we won't tell right now. But I've never been to heaven. So I thought, how can I write music that sounds like what he heard when I don't really know him? <laughs> but the Lord did it. So it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful, godly thing. So the feasts are a prophetic pattern of the coming of the Lord. So this is what I want to say. There are seven feasts on the biblical calendar. There are three spring feasts. There are three fall feasts. Wait, do you guys have winter, spring, summer, and fall in this country? Please tell me you know what I mean by spring and fall. Do your leaves ever turn brown here? I don't know. That's fall in America. Anyway, there are three feasts in the spring and three feasts in the fall. And in the middle is a bridge. In the long, dry summer, there's a bridge feast called Pentecost. And I'm going to share with you the significance of all these feasts. Little by little. So um, the first three spring feasts represent the first coming of the Lord Jesus to the earth. And the last three feasts of the year in the fall, like in roughly September, October, they represent the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And in between is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, like a bridge from heaven to earth to keep us going until our bridegroom comes back for us. Paul says the Holy Spirit is a little deposit of heaven in our hearts, in our inner man. He calls it a first fruits deposit of all the treasures that are waiting for us in what Bob was teaching about. When our bridegroom finally comes back to us. Is it okay right now with him far away in heaven? It's not okay. Doesn't Jesus say they will mourn and fast when the bridegroom is taken away? So we have a deposit and he lives in us, but aren't we waiting for the glorious day when our eyes will see him face to face? Isn't that the hope of our life? And he will come in us more and more powerfully, as Bob was teaching. Before he comes for us, he will come in us in a way that we have never dreamed. Just as a mere man, just like us, could be taken in the spirit realm and blow on an ash cloud that covered thousands of miles in the spirit, and heaven made it an earthly reality within 12 hours. That's the powers of the age to come right now. Amen? So that's what the feasts are about. So let me see um, <laughs> where I'm at right now. The feasts of the Lord are a prophetic pattern. 
If they're a pattern, they must be patterned after a reality in heaven. Doesn't the Bible say that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world? Before he was even born, before there was even a tree on the earth, he was the lamb eternally in the past and eternally into the future. Can you get your mind around that? He was the lamb of God in eternity before he was born as a baby to die on the cross, right? That means Passover is a pattern of something that existed before and something that will exist forever. Because in heaven it says they're waving palm branches and singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. So it's eternal. The cross is eternal. And the feasts are a pattern of something eternal. That's why they're waving palm branches, because that's what we do on the Feast of Tabernacles every year. We're rehearsing for the book of Revelation. It's a holy rehearsal. And it's for everyone that whosoever will. It's for all of us. And we're going to have our Passover together in just a couple days. And so these teachings are to get your heart so aligned with God's desire to fellowship with you. The king is giving a ball. The prince is giving a banquet. And sometimes the invited ones are too busy to come. Have you read that parable? He invited the chosen ones and they began to make excuses. He said, one said, well, I just got married. I'm really busy getting adjusted to marital life. Another said, I just bought a field. I really need to get it going. Another just bought a new business. I can't be bothered to come to your party. And the king was angry. And he said, well, go invite everyone. Go invite the poor, the broken, the disenfranchised. Go out onto the streets. And they said, well, we've done that, but there's still more seats in your banqueting hall. And he said, go out to the hedges and the highways and compel them to come to my banquet. I will have a full banquet. And he was angry at the ones that were too distracted by the pleasures and cares of this world to just sit and dine with their king. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you know, in ancient Jewish culture, when a young man and a young women, woman fell in love and wanted to get married, the father of the bride had a formal dinner for their engagement covenant to begin. In English, we call it a betrothal supper. And the parents of the bride would prepare a supper. And the father of the bridegroom and the bridegroom would walk to her house. Because once they came into her house, they would begin drinking a, an elaborate dinner ceremony of four cups of wine. And each cup was a deeper and deeper commitment to get engaged to the betrothal. It was a formal ceremony. Does this make sense? And the bridegroom would stand at the door and knock. And he would announce himself. Sometimes in those months, the bride had changed her mind or the parents had decided that they did not want their daughter to enter the covenant of engagement. Because remember when Mary was engaged to Joseph and she was found to be with child, remember they weren't actually married the way we would say married, but it said Joseph had in mind to divorce her. Did you read that? Didn't you ever think how could he divorce her? They were only engaged. Did you ever wonder that? The answer is in Jewish culture, an engagement is as binding as a marriage. If you break an engagement, it's, it's like a divorce, biblically. So when you start drinking those four cups during this long dinner with the bridegroom, you're getting in deeper and deeper. And if you break it, you're in trouble. So if she didn't want to marry him anymore, they would not answer that knock on the door. The bridegroom would stand at the door and announce himself. And if she didn't want to get married, she wouldn't answer the door. That was her parents' way of saying, We've changed our mind. And finally, the father and the son would leave. They would know that they were not wanted to enter into that betrothal covenant. 
and they would never come back again and knock. When Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Did I knock? I was just knocking the air. That was loud. (laughs) Okay, I don't know how I'm banging the noise, but... So he was talking like a Jewish bridegroom in love. I want a betrothal. I want a commitment. I want a covenant. I want to drink four cups of Passover wine with you. And beloved, it's better to not even drink the first cup with him than to change your mind later. It would be better never to get engaged than to promise him your life, your love, your heart forever, and then decide he's not worth the sacrifice and the cost. It would be better to not open the door. How many of you know he's worth it all? This week in the Philippines, we are talking about covenant. People in the, in the, the world we live in make and break promises as easily as they throw away an empty pack of cigarettes. Covenant doesn't mean what it should mean. But we are talking about a covenant with you as individual lovers of Jesus and as a nation. You are standing in the gap for an entire nation and making a covenant and saying, as for us and our nation, we will pay the price. We will lead our nation into discipleship of the most radical, costly nature. Don't think it's cheap and don't think it's easy to drink those four cups of Passover wine. But he's worth it all. And the devil will lie to you till your last breath. He's not worth it. It's too painful. It hurts too much. It's too costly. Look at what has been taken away from you for his sake. He will discourage you and say, he's not worth it. Look what he's letting them do to you. But yes, he is worth it. Amen? Please mark this in your heart. Covenant is costly. It wouldn't be right to say, let's all just work up this covenant and all get happy and all sign it. Yes, that's good. But know that this is a costly walk. I I wouldn't be doing you any favor to not tell you the cost, right? Behold, he stands at the door and knocks at the gates, the seven gates of the Philippines. And every gate has been opened by the prophetic word of the Lord. He loved you enough to tell the names of those seven cities to a prophet who didn't even know how to pronounce them. Do you think every nation on this earth has gotten a word like that? I don't think so. Would he? Yes. But has there been the prophetic word and people that will sit up every night from midnight till 3 a.m. and just wait to hear the prophetic word for your nation? Praise God for the prophets of God and for Brother Robert. I'm honored to work with Brother Robert. I'm honored. Praise God. Okay. The first three feasts are to prepare you for his first coming. You might say, well, Jill, he already came. Why do we have to prepare the earth for his first coming? They were put on the calendar to prepare my people, Israel, to recognize the Lamb of God when he came. And yet we didn't. Yes, some of us did. All the early disciples and apostles were Jews but they were a minority of the nation. 
sadly. But remember I said they're all rehearsals. Some of them you're rehearsing the past and some of them you're rehearsing the future, right? So let's review all seven feasts and I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of all seven. And then we'll see what time we have left to kind of expand on the prophetic significance within this time frame tonight. But first, I'd like to give you a couple scriptures. Um, I think this might be on slide two, Isaiah 25, verses six to eight. I'm going to read it to you. This is in the Old Testament. Isaiah wrote this 750 years before the Lord Jesus was born. And it's a rehearsal for the wedding supper of the Lamb. I love to quote this. It's Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 8. And in this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make a feast for all people. A feast of choice meat and the best refined wine of fat meat and marrow and well-refined wines. And he will destroy the shroud that covers the nations and the cloud of darkness that covers the surface of the peoples. And he will destroy death forever. And he will wipe away every tear from our eye, from all the earth. What is Isaiah talking about? The millennial reign is going to be ushered in with the king giving a banquet in Jerusalem for all the nations of the earth to come up to his holy mountain when he is in his fleshly glorified physical body reigning as the greater King David from the real Jerusalem over all the earth. Well, is he just going to reign all alone over the whole earth? He could. Is he worthy to reign alone over all the earth? Yes. Is he brilliant and powerful enough to reign alone and make every decision forever over the entire earth? Absolutely. Does he desire to reign without his help meet the bride? No. He's a God of intimate relationship. He doesn't want to reign alone because he desires you to partner with him. He desires. He has emotions. He's Jewish. He has a lot of emotional desire and love for his bride from all the nations to rule and reign by his side, in his heart, on his throne, over the cities, over the nations, over the continents. If you're anything like me, I'll tell you the deepest secret thought of my heart. How could he possibly desire me? Has anyone ever thought that? Or is it just me? Oh, come on, it can't just be me. Didn't anyone ever feel like, why would someone so beautiful, surrounded by the music of heaven, the angels of heaven, the saints of heaven, the Father, that shining jewel upon the throne, why would he desire a filthy, broken life like mine? Has anyone ever thought that? But he does. Do you want to know why? Because he's the sweetest, most generous, most loving, most relational man that has ever lived on the earth. That's why. Because Adam, it wasn't good for Adam to rule the earth alone. It wasn't good for him to be alone. And God the Father gave him a partner. As, as in Hebrew, an ezer means a helper bride. A bride who wasn't just a pretty little decoration around the earth, but she was a helper in the sense of almost like a military partner. That's what it meant. And the Father didn't want his precious, beautiful son to reign alone. Because he's a God of relationship. And he takes the weakest, most broken, most wretched 
of the earth. Well, I qualify good. And he, he takes this harlot and makes her a bride. He takes this beggar and makes him a king. He takes this broken life and clothes us in power and glory and immortality just because he's good. Do you want to partner with a king like that? I do too. Male and female, he created them. The bride is not just women. (laughs) The bride is a corporate body of beloved sons and daughters that make up a bridal company that will be a terrifying army on the earth. This bride is not a pretty little thing to make the king look good. This bride is a warrior, and the demons tremble. And I haven't even talked about the feasts yet. I'm really sorry. Okay, Jill, get with the program. Okay, so what makes a bride really a fierce enemy to the enemy of our souls. Is it because she can shout louder? No. Is it because she can sing harder? No. What qualifies the bride? God said in Isaiah, I think it's 55, I might get that wrong. He said, I dwell in a high and lofty place, but I dwell with a broken, contrite heart. What qualifies us to be a bride is the lowness of our heart. Satan can deal with the louder, the stronger, the bigger, the better. Our army boots are thicker leather. He's only afraid of a humble, lovesick, voluntary, broken bride. That's what terrifies the enemy because he can't touch that one. Do you want to adorn yourself with humility? Do you know the fragrance that gives your bridegroom king? When you adorn yourself and put on humility, he smells a fragrance that makes him desire you more than anything. And just like we were praying and confessing our sins an hour or two ago, we were putting on humility and repenting for the sins of pride and thinking that we're better than others, right? We have to crucify that. Okay, I'm going to move to the feast. Sorry. That was slide two, right? (laughs) Okay. Okay, the first feast is Passover. 